Hey folks, welcome to the show. Uh, it's a fun variety show with singing and different acts, but today I'm just going to be interviewing a friend of mine, Michael Wilkerson. Mike, uh, you uh, write frequently, I guess weekly now, at Stormwall... Stormwall.com. Dot com. Stormwall.com. I want people to know, out of the gate, Stormwall.com, but... You've written a book called Why America Matters, The Case for New Exceptionalism. I want to talk to you a little bit about that. We've talked about it in the past. It sure. is a magnificent achievement. Uh, I have read every word of the book, um, and it, it really is an extraordinary book. It's called Why America Matters, The Case for New Exceptionalism. Um, but before we get into that, um, I just want to talk to you about some of the things that are going on right now, most of which I don't understand. I hear there's a banking crisis. Uh, I hear that uh, there are problems with in the crypto world. Uh, help us understand what you see happening. You know, absolutely, Eric. By way of background, I spent uh, over a decade on Wall Street as a merger and acquisitions advisor, as an investor uh, for another decade, led a public company. And through this time, I've been watching very closely what's ha been happening in the economy, what's been happening with money, uh, something that most of the time we don't talk a lot about. But we're at this critical inflection point in our history where funny things are happening with our money around the world. What do I mean by that? We're at a point in time where you recall the 2008 financial crisis. That was really a crisis where home households, individuals, were over levered. They had too much debt. They were in trouble because of how the, the mortgage market had gotten out of hand. We got through that, but only by moving a lot of that debt to the government's balance sheet. So at the time, it was, house, it was homes or individuals that were uh, indebted or, or too much. Today, it's really the government. And coming out of the financial crisis, a number of lessons were learned, but it also made people very much aware of the dangers of governments that run deficits, where they spend more than they earn, and they do that year after year. But haven't we in the United States been doing that for many, 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 many years? Have we not been doing this? So it turns out that we didn't used to do it. But since 2001, we've run deficits every year. In fact, cumulatively, we've now run $20.7 trillion worth of deficits. Okay, we had a balanced budget the last time in 2001, and the, in the 90s we'd go up and down, but generally there was a much stronger push. And we kind of abandoned all hope at some point that we could ever get back to a balanced budget. It certainly happened during the global financial crisis. Well, why does this matter? How have we paid for this deficit that runs year after year? And again, deficit, simply put, is you're spending more than you're taking in. If you do that one year, it's one thing. If you do it for what's now been nearly a quarter of a century, and you're accumulating debt, government debt, in order to uh, pay for that deficit, because you're not bringing in the revenue to do it through taxes or otherwise, at some point, the chickens come home to roost. What do I mean by that? At some point, the value of the currency starts uh, depreciating, it starts losing its value. It is why, in my view, we've seen the inflation that we've seen in the last two years. It is not... Uh, Putin's price hike. It is not all the other reasons that we've been you given. You mean Biden's been lying? Come on. Um, well, uh, keep going. Okay. So, yeah. so what? So the cause of the inflation that we've seen has been this runaway deficit. In fact, every inflation, high inflation or hyperinflation in the 20th century, and they've all been in, in the 20th century because it's the first time when countries issued paper money instead of money that was backed by something real, gold, silver, something else. All hyperinflations have been caused by deficits that get out of control, that are sustained year after year after year. And at some point, uh, it breaks the value of the currency, and that's when you see inflation start to, to run. I've been saying all year long that we are on a path towards persistent and continued inflation. We've seen inflation come down as high as 9% last summer. Last month, it was just below 5%, but that's way, way, way above the value uh, that it should be. In, in other words, families are paying more and more each year. And by the way, when I say 5%, that's what the consumer price index says it is. Within the consumer price index, the things that people actually use, like uh, food, energy, shelter, transportation, 
inflation in those categories is actually much higher than the 5%. And there's a real argument that says CPI doesn't even correctly measure it. If you look at, uh, for example, what people buy. Uh, I did a multi-year look at my own Amazon Prime purchases and saw that inflation in food and, and other categories, household goods categories, was significantly higher than what the statistics, the CPI statistics were showing us. This matters a lot because this is coming after the working class, the middle class, more than anyone else. Okay, so where does this conceivably go? Okay, it can go one of two ways. Uh, if we don't address the deficit, and it looks like there's no chance that we're going to, then it's going to lead to h higher and higher and more sustained inflation. Yeah, okay, is this like Germany in the 1920s where uh, it, it just, it's runaway inflation, it goes to where your money is worthless? This, it's a possibility. I, 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 let's hope not. That is one terrible outcome. There have been other inflations that have gone into what they call hyper or very high inflations that haven't gone that bad. But you know what happened in Germany was they increased their money supply, the amount of, of money in circulation, doubled it, tripled it. And it was over, they did that for eight years. And it was only in the, like the eighth year when hyperinflation really kicked in. So they were able to continue the farce for a long time. Eric, here in the United States, since the global financial crisis, the U.S. has troubled its money supply, increased it by threefold. We have three times as many dollars today floating around in the banking system and in the economy than we did 15 years ago. That is what is causing the inflationary pressure. And that is why I say until you deal with the money supply, until you get the deficit under control, inflation will not end. We'll, we'll see this continue. Well, do you see, you, you just said you don't see that happening. We, who, I, who, who what do I, we have? What I, sorry, no, what I said was I, didn't, I don't necessarily see a Weimar Republic German hyperinflation happening. What I do see, because that one went to an, an extreme where you had a you know, billion percent inflation. Yeah, yeah. Now, hyperinflation means that prices are going up 500% every month, month after month. So that's already way more than we are right now. I'm not yeah. saying that it is likely that we'll go to hyperinflation. I am saying there is a possibility. Even if we don't, high inflation, severe inflation is bad enough. Okay, You don't have to have the dollar go to absolute zero for this to be very devastating on our economy, on our society. Inflations prelude political upheaval because people are out of jobs. People don't have money. They can't afford right. to do what, what they do. So th this is the kind of thing that can contribute to even a violent political upheaval, pitchforks on the street kind of things, yeah. when people don't have the ability to feed their own families. That's right. when it gets serious. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to end on an up note. We've got about a minute left. So um, what can we do? What do you see are, uh, as something that, that we can do to avert these horrors? Is it electing people who take this seriously? Does Kevin McCarthy take this seriously enough? What do you think? We've got to get people in power who see the danger and do something about it. We have to get back to a demand for a balanced budget. It's not that hard. If we cut 1% out of every line item, forget about whether it's a Republican idea, a Democrat idea, right or left, just take 1% from everything we would be well on our way to balancing the budget. We have to take uh, this seriously, otherwise we're going down a dark path. But, but you certainly don't see Biden or the Democrats caring enough to do that. No one's willing to do it right now. No one's willing, no to, do one's it willing right. to do it right now. And that is why even over this issue of the debt ceiling bill, nothing really happened. We didn't accomplish what we wanted. We're now basically they're free to increase the debt level between now and January 2025, which means they did not take the courageous choice. They didn't do what they needed to do to confront the situation. Welcome back. Talking to Mike Wilkerson, or Michael Wilkerson, as it says on the cover of the book. The book is Why America Matters, The Case for New Exceptionalism. Um, Mike, this is a great book. Uh, I've read it. Uh, I liked it so much that I said something nice about it, and you put it on the cover of the book. <laughs> But I didn't do that, you know, just to be nice. I don't do that. Uh, on the back of the book, uh, you have uh, an extraordinary um, blurb from Miranda Devine. Many people know her from the New York Post, heroic uh, journalist. She writes, 
a crisply written lament for our fractured national identity, Wilkerson's tour de force is a blueprint for a new generation left to rebuild the moral capital squandered by their forebears. Not bad, coming from Miranda Devine. Um, you say a lot in the book, uh, but I want to talk to you now about some of the stuff that you don't necessarily get into in the book, uh, or maybe you do and I forgot, but dealing with crypto and where we are right now. This is the kind of stuff you write at stormwall.com every week, stormwall.com. So uh, what's happening in that in, in the crypto world that I don't understand? So before the break, we were talking about the global financial crisis and how in order to try to solve the economy's issues, the government issued a massive amount of debt. And yeah. a lot of people at that time were very concerned that that was going to be the spark for inflation. And the entire crypto industry really came out of that period of time. The inventor or inventors of Bitcoin, which was the first and most well-known, was developed in around that time, 2008 to 2009. Why? Because they recognized that governments have a monopoly on the issuance of money, what's called fiat currency, when the government issues it. No one else can do it. Now, back in the day, it used to be that states could issue money and all that sort of thing, but today, only the federal government can issue currency. And some people realized that this was going to be, at some point, the game would be up, that, that inflation would set in, that governments would be bankrupt, that there'd be no way to, uh, to get out of this mess. The only way you can deal with this sort of uh, debt is to default on your debt, some small countries do that very hard for the U.S. for the issuer of the global reserve currency to default. You can tax people to try to get the money to pay the debt, or you can secretly tax it through inflation. The crypto industry grew out of this knowledge. They wanted to create something, a form of money, in the case of Bitcoin, that was not dependent on the state. It was stateless and that no government was required to issue it. It was permissionless in that uh, you didn't need your bank's permission to send me money or vice versa, and I hope you do at some point soon. That would be great. But it was also decentralized in that there was no single point of attack where you could go after it the way you could in the markets for money. Okay, I have to ask, how is this different from gold and silver? Well, I don't need a government to issue. I can get gold and silver and keep it. And You're right. So here's the thing. So just like with cash, gold, or crypto, you have privacy autonomy, the ability to transact, no one else can, controls it. I don't know if in your bag you're carrying around a lot of gold right now, but it has a portability issue, and it has a sort of, a, so across space, getting it from one place to another for a transaction, and across time, digital currencies, Bitcoin or otherwise, can travel across time and space instantly. Which is why I don't like them, because when you make something really, really easy, there's always a price that you pay. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's kind of like saying, like, the government can't do enough. It's like, yeah, it's designed for it to be difficult to do stuff. That's the, that's the, uh, the deliberate um, check on various powers. You don't want it to be able to move instantly. You, you want there to be some deliberation. There's an upside to that. So when you make things that can happen instantly with electronic transactions, uh, part of that is the the lack of privacy that that everybody can see potentially what I'm doing in other words it's a little bit more complicated I, I don't know that ha having to carry around gold or ship gold is the biggest problem in the world it seems like we have bigger problems than that so interestingly the difference between things like Bitcoin or ethereum these cryptocurrencies and what you're hearing a lot about these days which is CBdc's central bank digital currencies is the point that you're making. The way governments are, governments hate crypto. They're deathly afraid of it. Why? It takes the power out of their hands, the power to issue money. Crypto, Bitcoin, it was designed to not be inflationary. It has zero inflation over the long run, whereas we've seen in our own country, inflation is going uh, double digits in some cases, as it, as it is in Europe. The governments hate it because it removes their power. And... Actually, Bitcoin transactions, the users are anonymous. The transactions can be seen visibly on the blockchain, on the ledger. Mm -hmm. This is the distinction between a mostly anonymous. I mean, you can still identify transactions and trace things back because it's all there. That's how uh, analysts discovered the FTX fraud was they could go and look at everything that happened and realize there was something funny going on there. Governments, in terms of CBDCs, their intention is to be able to surveil, 
to be able to see everything that goes on with these transactions, surveil and ultimately control because they will have the ability to shape behavior. If we talk about uh, universal basic income or other payments, other things like that, they can turn the faucet so, on. So or these off. are liberty issues. These are liberty, uh, and issues. that's what that's what concerns me more than anything. Of course, is the idea that uh, you know when the government knows where and when and how I'm spending money, I feel like that's none of their business. Um, but they are increasingly able. Uh, to track people's movements and to track uh, how people spend money. And they can use this, just as they're doing in China, to control human beings, to mm -hmm. diminish our freedoms. This is exactly right. And this is why, uh, again, imagine that these two things, government-issued CBDCs and crypto, as in Bitcoin or Ethereum or otherwise, are opposite ends of the pole. Okay. One allows privacy, one allows autonomy, one allows uh, permissionless transactions. In other words, you don't have to ask your bank or anybody else to, to do something. Stateless transactions, decentralized. So these are opposite ends of the, of, of, of the scale. Now, what I've been writing about most recently, Eric, is we have seen over the course of this year, the Biden administration crack down very, very hard on the crypto industry. I will go as far as to say they have declared war on crypto. Which makes perfect sense. So we've seen, and it makes total sense, we've seen in the last couple of weeks that the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, has gone after uh, the large uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. Now, one was FTX. That was r run by a fraudster. Or it was a fraud run by fraudsters. But keep in mind, the technology is neither good nor bad. You know, just because there was a crypto fraud, it's no different than Enron. We didn't ban energy trading after Enron. Right. We didn't ban financial services after Bernie Madoff. The difference here is now they're going after, for example, a company called Coinbase, which is a U.S. listed public company uh, regulated by who is, oh, the SEC. So the SEC has been regulating this company for three years, has been a, approved their IPO. The company has been trying to engage with them over the last three years, gotten uh, nowhere, and now they're being sued. Why is that? To get to the punchline here, which is, as I mentioned, Government hates crypto. It hates the idea, the threat. To, uh, it, it is a boon to liberty. It is a boon to personal autonomy. Uh, but it is risky for governments. And so they're doing everything they can to kill the industry. Now, that's going to hurt America in a big way. You're old enough to remember the tech revolution of the 1990s. At that point in time, government tried to kill it because they didn't like the idea of cryptography. They were afraid that when people like you and me used AOL or whatever the platform was and we had our emails uh, cryptographically sealed, that the government wouldn't be able to get into it. That would be a security leak. Well, we overcame those concerns. The U.S. decided to invest behind uh, technology. There was even a proposal to tax e uh, emails that went back and forth to replace uh, income for the Postal Service. But we didn't do any of those foolish things. We actually took a pretty good policy, and the U.S. became the number one leader in the tech industry. Today, we are scaring off the, all the crypto companies, all the uh, individuals and entrepreneurs, chasing them offshore, pushing it into a position where okay, the U.S. When, cannot win. When you say we... Government. You mean the Biden administration. The Biden administration. You don't mean the government. You mean the Biden administration. The Biden administration. Because if and you the, had a different and kind the, of leader mm -hmm. and a different kind of administration, I'm suspecting they would not be doing what the Biden administration is doing. It's the Biden administration, and I say government in the sense of the uh, permanent bureaucracy, the deep state. Right. Okay, the, the parts that are that The anti-liberty, bureaucratic, That's deep right. state, um, which is uh, entrenched and uh, which is authoritarian and which is anti-founders vision uh, and which is the swamp that has to be drained. Yes. So the theory is that uh, if somebody like a Trump or a DeSantis were in the White House, that wouldn't be happening. That's right. It's or, or at least it, yeah. they would go to war with those who are at war with liberty. I mean, it's interesting to watch right now that the three leading contenders uh, against Biden, assuming that Biden runs, former President Trump, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, and attorney and Kennedy leg bearer, Robert, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., all of which who have made a core pillar of their platform to confront and address the deep state, to address the administrative state. It's reflective of the realities 
that Americans, that the, the cover has been pulled off in the last few years in a way that it never was. This, this is, we're, we're going to uh, go to break, but this is really the big news. Uh, we'll be right back. We're talking to Michael Wilkerson. The book is Why America Matters. Folks, welcome back. I'm talking to Michael Wilkerson. Uh, his book is Why America Matters, The Case for a New Exceptionalism. Uh, and his website is stormwall.com, stormwall.com. Mike, um, so we were just talking about the deep state. It's an amazing thing that just a few years ago, none of us had heard the term. None of us really bought into the uniparty idea, the idea that there's this permanent bureaucracy in America of unelected officials, or to use the technical term, bums, who couldn't care less what the American people think. They couldn't care less about the founders' vision and the constitution of self-government. And they have uh, arrogated to themselves powers. The good news is that we are now aware of these dark uh, anti-freedom forces, anti-American forces, but we're in an ideological and political and I would say spiritual war in dealing with this because once you said the mask is, is off, we see this mm -hmm. and they are actingly, I would say increasingly uh, authoritarian because they realize, you know, like the demons, that the, their time is short. Like if they don't go all in now to crush those against them, they're in big trouble because we are now on to them. It shows that it's coming to an end, that the, the corruption with inside the system is breaking it down internally, and you're right, they're reacting. Eric, this goes all the way back to President Dwight Eisenhower's farewell speech when he said, beware the military-industrial complex. Kennedy saw it. He switched from sort of Cold Warrior to uh, somebody who's trying to end the Cold War, uh, deal with a nuclear confrontation, and he resisted strongly the forces of the deep state, and they killed him for it. Okay, I mean, look, let, let, let's hit pause there. I think that that is true. It's only really come to my attention clearly in the last year. Uh, I had Roger Stone on the program a number of times talking about, uh, you know, who killed Kennedy. And it seems undeniable that Kennedy uh, and his brother, in their own strength, went up against the forces of hell, uh, CIA, the FBI, you name it, this deeply entrenched, corrupt uh, Leviathan, but they did it, I'm speaking as a Christian, kind of in their own strength. In other words, they thought, we can do this, um, and they were both killed. I, if you had said to me just a few years ago that, you know, the forces of darkness, the CIA, blah, 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 killed the Kennedys, I would have said, well, that sounds like a conspiracy theory. Unfortunately, uh, it seems to me that it's not a conspiracy theory. They were on to something, and that something... Uh, murdered them and has continued to grow. And you just mentioned that the three people uh, running against Joe Biden or whatever his name is, um, they're, they're onto this today as well. Something sh has shifted. Now, even specifically with regard to Kennedy or the Kennedys and their assassinations, there has been so much new information that has come out in this century, since the 90s, rolling waves of declassifications. The actors involved in this criminal uh, enterprise are now dead. But when you look at that accumulated weight of evidence, it's overwhelming. Like the, the conspiracy theory would be to pretend, continue to pretend right. that it didn't happen. Good book, JFK and the Unspeakable hits on this in very meticulous detail. I believe the author is James Douglas. But for, for, for your listeners who JFK are interested. JFK and the Unspeakable. And the Unspeakable. Um, well, you, you were just saying that, you know, it becomes harder and harder to deny, but it is horrifying, and I think it's uh, consonant with a lot that's been happening just in the last three years, that people are waking up to things that they would rather firmly uh, uh, dismiss. Yeah. I, but you mm -hmm. begin less and less to be able to dismiss things, whether it's the, the way COVID happened or was handled, uh, whether the election, how the election was handled or mishandled, it seems increasingly clear 
that these things are real and that we have to face them. So one of the things I talk about in Why America Matters, the book that you were kind enough to, to read and, and, and endorse, was this idea of, of how the deep state has used the pandemic, has used uh, even today the war in Ukraine to accomplish objectives that are not what they say they are. I mentioned JFK in part because this year is the 60th anniversary uh, of the 1963 November assassination of the president at that time, 60 years ago. And I think, given where we are today, it is a moment that we should take a hard look at it again. I was thinking about it. It's almost like the, um, the Holocaust or the Rwandan genocide. We know it happened intellectually, but we don't, we're not connected to it morally or otherwise. You need to visit a site. You need to, to hear the stories of individuals in order to actually have it connect personally. Americans need to do that today with the situation in our government. Where we have been wrong in our generation is to leave it for somebody else. This is somebody else's problem. I've got my own life, I've got my own job, I've got this or that. No, it's time for us to stare for a moment at this reality of what happened in the 60s through, through all of those events and what is happening today through everything that we've seen, whether it be all of the lockdown madness, the, the, the pandemic madness, the control things that were going on there, Russia Gate, all of these things that are hiding in plain sight. Because I, like you, believe that this is a moment where the walls are coming down upon those who have continued to perpetuate the wickedness of the, this system, this Babylonian-like system, and the day is coming. And, and we do have to say it, it is wickedness, it is evil. And I think that's part of what's interesting is a lot of people are waking up to the concept of evil. They look around and they say, this is not just bad, this is not just difference of opinion. It smells like evil. And the only antidote, the only answer to evil is God, the God of the Bible. Um, and we've drifted far from him in this country, but by his grace, we may get back there because things have gotten so bad. Plenty more coming up, talking to Michael Wilkerson. The book is Why America Matters, and you can find him at stormwall.com. Welcome back, talking to Michael Wilkerson. You can find him at stormwall.com. You should. Uh, the book is Why America Matters, The Case for New Exceptionalism. All right, Michael, we're talking about heavy stuff, yeah. um, and we're talking about this... Uh, I mean, I talk about it wherever I go and on this program constantly, that, that America is waking up in, you know, it's kind of like a, like, a, like a rolling awakening because some people haven't been ready to see this until five minutes ago. Some people were talking about it a year ago, three years ago. Some people still haven't seen it, but they're on the verge of seeing it because it's a lot to take in. It's like the death camps. When we discovered the satanic evil of the Nazis, most people had to look away, had to say, I'm sorry, there's something missing with the picture. There's no way that Germany would do this kind of thing. Um, we're dealing with evil, and it's hard for human beings who've lived in reasonably civilized times to face that kind of thing. But it seems to me like that's part of what we in the West, and especially in America, are processing. And I keep saying that the only answer to it is, is the church, or the, the, the central answer is the church. People in the church need to wake up. We have a moral responsibility uh, to deal with evil, to call out corruption, to stand against it. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of what I see happening, and it's part of what you're talking about with, with, with all this stuff uh, at the end of the day. You know, Eric, it's so interesting to think about um, what has happened over the course of the last you know, three years. This has been a dramatic shift. And, and for many Americans, it was the first awakening of their own souls to it. And in many ways, it was for me as well. Um, when I started writing this book, somebody said, hey, or are you writing a political book? I said, no, no, I'm writing a, I'm writing a romance. I'm writing a love story for my country. And the more I got into what I was writing about in Why America Matters, the more I was convinced that I had to do it. This was the proverbial fire in the bones where I wanted to get a message out um, talking about even what I had discovered through the process of awakening, through the process of coming to terms, uh, as we talked about before the break, of looking at something horrific when you actually choose to stare at it and engage it and let it touch you. It changes you. We're in a moment where Americans have, have an opportunity to awaken to this, where leaders all over. Eric, our nation has been hijacked 
by forces that are deep, that are dark. You know, we talked before the break about the military industrial com uh, complex. It is the, those industries, it is big pharma, it is big corporations, all of these things and our nation, our leaders in government, in the current administration and others have sold the national soul to these corrupted interests, to financial interests and otherwise. This is a moment when Americans need to be bothered, when we need to wake up. If we don't do it now, and you talk about this often, is that if we don't do it now, it will, it will be too late. And it may sound like I'm stringing together a bunch of different things, the deep state and uh, deficit spending, inflation and all this sort of thing, but it is all part of one big system that is depriving Americans of their freedom and their liberty. There's, there's no question about it. And again, the easy thing to do to, is to dismiss it as conspiracy theory. And there are people out there who will believe anything, whether it's right or wrong, or, you know, people who believe the earth is flat, uh, people believe uh, Hillary Clinton is a lizard person. Uh, unfortunately, what we're talking about is true, and if you don't have the category of evil, uh, you, you, you can't deal with this. In other words, you, you have to understand that in human history, uh, we have seen various manifestations of evil. The Holocaust, mm -hmm. the death camps is a classic example of what happened in Rwanda. Um, we see this. The problem that I say uh, happened in Germany, uh, why the church was silent and which is happening in America to some extent now is that people have had things so good that they thought, well, you know what, whatever that evil stuff is, that can't happen here. We've moved past that. We're a civilized, cultured Christian society. We don't, we don't do evil. And that's the difficulty, is for people to process this. And we're seeing all kinds of people processing it. I always think at the top of the list is my friend Naomi Wolf, who was, was a liberal, pro-Gore, pro-Clinton, feminist, whatever, who has woken up to these things. And it's very painful, ultimately, to wake up to it, because you say, I don't want to see this. It's too awful. But then when you've seen it, you feel like, OK, if this evil is real, then God is real, and then God wants to use me and will help me to defeat this evil. And that's why, ultimately, we're bringing hope. But in order to see the hope, you have to see the problem. In order to, to want Jesus, you have to realize, I need Jesus. Without him, I'm lost. Th that's the same concept uh, that we're dealing with here, because it, for many people, they just want to go back to you know, when things seem to be okay, or go along with whatever they need to go along mm -hmm. with to keep at bay uh, the horror. You know, and I talk about in Why America Matters, the idea that America is exceptional, that it has a destiny, that actually God has chosen and, and used America with all its flaws and foibles for a purpose in the world. And part of that purpose is defending liberty, is defending uh, humans' ability to have the freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom uh, to, of association, all of the things that we have tried to protect here and around the world. We are also talking about we've done some very bad things through those same, uh, the CIA and otherwise. However, the ideals of liberty, democracy, God-given and alienable rights that cannot be taken away by a government, cannot be taken away by a bureaucracy or a corporation. It is those ideals that we uphold. To your point on, and you've talked a lot, and in, in to the American churches, the American churches continue to believe that we are in an era of Jesus the Lamb, the suffering servant, and we're just going to sit passively by, and if they come for us, they come for us. That is false. That is the wrong approach for this moment. We are in an era of Jesus the Lion, okay, the one who goes out riding, conquering and to conquer. And I do believe that, you, that it is a moment in time when the heavens themselves are crying out for justice, and we're seeing uh, an end of a 50-year generational cycle of sin uh, corporately, meaning you know, national sin, that has to be addressed and will be addressed in our life lifetimes. Well, there's such a thing as history, ladies and gentlemen. There was a civil war. It wasn't a theory. There, there come moments when there's a reckoning, uh, whether it's in the bloodshed of a war or, or in other ways, uh, and we are definitely uh, at a moment like that. You could say that the, the Reformation was such a moment when things rise to a level of such horror that there ha something has to give. Um, so these are very important things. Mike, we're going to keep you for a final segment. Ladies and gentlemen, you can find Michael Wilkerson at stormwall.com. The book is Why America Matters. 
Welcome back. Final segment with Michael Wilkerson. The book is Why America Matters, The Case for a New Exceptionalism. Um, Eric Metaxas calls it an astonishing achievement, but what does he know? Uh, Michael, it is a, an extraordinary book. You, you cover so much in it. It's almost like two books in one. People can find you at stormwall.com. Uh, you have a Twitter account, Stormwall, right? Yep. Is that right? Um, you and I both... Uh, are men of faith who believe there is reason to hope. And we don't just mean theoretically, although that's not unimportant. Our ultimate hope is in the God of Scripture. There's no question about that. He calls us to rejoice in all circumstances, to be anxious for nothing. To be, I mean, that is very real. But um, in the natural, to some extent, uh, you and I also both believe that if people will get active and serious about being citizens and living out our faith in every sphere instead of sitting back, that there is a way to turn this around. I'm deeply convinced of that, otherwise I wouldn't be running around the country talking about it. Yeah. One of the things in this process, Eric, for me, of writing Why America Matters, and we've, we've been talking about very heavy issues, very sobering issues, but I will say that this process has filled me with a, uh, you know, kind of a new sense of courage uh, excitement and joy because I, I share your belief that it is not futile, that it is not in vain. And as I have gone uh, virtually around the country in radio shows and otherwise talking about this book and realizing that people uh, want that hope, that they're looking to understand what's happening and they're looking for a message that tells them there is a way forward, there is a path out of these deep, dark woods. And there is something that every man, woman, and even child in this country can do in their own ways to move us forward on, on this path. And one of the messages I really try to get across in Why America Matters is this isn't tops down. This isn't about who sits in the office, Oval Office every four years. Of course that matters, but it must be grassroots. It has to be bottoms up. It has to be this generation waking up and engaging again because we fell asleep for a, for a generation waking up and doing what Americans did historically, remarkably, which was civic engagement, getting involved in the political process well, locally. Well, and by the way, part of that is making sure that our elections are on the up and up. We have allowed uh, evil people, corrupt people, power mongers, to destroy our confidence in our own elections, much less in the elections themselves, but just to destroy our ability to even feel that my vote makes a difference. Um, and so that's part of the civic engagement. And again, if things hadn't gotten this bad, if we hadn't seen this wickedness on parade, wherever you look, a lot of people would still be sleeping. They, they, yeah. this, this is the good part of seeing the horror is that you say, okay, I, I didn't, now that it's manifested itself, now I can see what yeah. needs dealing with. There's the old saying that you can't unsee what's been seen, and that is so true today that for the first time, Americans in, in, in mass have seen the wickedness, have seen the institutional evil. You talked about the election system, but have seen what's going on in our public schools, in our uh, university systems. We, well, not we, but uh, those systems are totally brainwashing our children totally distorting their understanding of what it means to be human, let alone a citizen of this nation, and that will not stand. And I think probably more than anything, parents realizing that this was happening to their children has been a primary motivation to get people off the proverbial couch and, in, and onto the streets engaged in these things. In conclusion, praise the Lord. Praise um, the Lord. I'm talking to Michael Wilkerson, have been talking to Michael Wilkerson. The book is Why... America Matters. You can find him at stormwall.com. You can find me at ericmetaxas.com. If you sign up for my newsletter, we will send you the video version of this interview, which I hope you will share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Michael Wilkerson. Thanks, Eric.